Indaba, my children. Book 1. The Bud Slowly Opens. Episode 1. The Sacred Story of the Tree of Life. The Creation of the Universe. Nothing exists but darkness. Nothing exists but nothingness. No stars, sun, moon, or earth. Only a terrifying darkness, floating along the invisible river of time. Suddenly, river time desires the nothingness, like a flesh and blood male beast desires a female partner. So they mate, and through the union of time and nothingness, a little tiny spark of living fire is born, born into utter nothingness. The spark grows conscious, conscious of its utter loneliness. It frantically flies around in the dark like a tiny firefly, trying to flee from where there is no escape, trying to flee from utter nothingness. The spark stops fleeing and decides to grow instead, to increase in size until it's no longer engulfed by nothingness, but becomes its equal in size. It feeds only upon itself, for there's nothing else to feed on. It grows and it grows, and Mother Nothingness is displeased and tries to destroy it, first by smothering it in darkness, then by casting the spell of cold onto the spark. But the spark resisted brighter and hotter still, until it grew equal to nothingness in size, and devoured her, and digested her, with the most awful flash of light ever seen. River Time is outraged. He sends a spirit cold to annihilate the spark, who is now a universal roaring flame, filling the sky with many soaring tongues. From this battle a portion of the flame is turned into cold white ash. This ancient battle rages on, and shall go on until time ceases to flow. Should the flame win, all shall be incinerated. Should the cold win, all shall freeze to death. May they fight forevermore. Unkulunkulu, the great spirit, is displeased with the wasteful and senseless war. He commands the great mother Ma to arise from the still warm ashes. Ma, the all-knowing, the most merciful. Ma, the first goddess of human shape. From the sparks that the flame shot out, Ma creates the stars, the sun, and the earth at the command of Unkulunkulu. Although immortal, the Great Mother is cast with mortal feelings like anger, hunger, jealousy, love, and lust. They are like diseases within her being. This is why she is depicted by woodcovers as imperfect. Either a leg is deformed, or one hand is bigger than the other, or one breast is much bigger than the other. From the Great Mother Ma, humans and beasts alike inherit their faults. Imperfect seed begets imperfect fruit. Ma sits on top of Tabazimbi, the mountain of iron, awaiting further instruction. She weeps so loudly and bitterly from a feeling of utter loneliness that the stars trembled and fell from the sky, and her tears formed a great lake at her feet and spread across the land in all directions, forming the streams, rivers, lakes, and oceans that we see today. From the great spirit, Ma demands a companion. For the first time in its existence, the universe hears the voice of the Supreme, the highest of the high. It howls like a tempest through the starry skies, like thunder upon the plains, re-echoing through the valleys and the gorges, shaking the great barren cliffs like trees in a gale. Lightning bolts tear across the skies. Howling cyclones sweep the rocky plains. Mighty earthquakes send the mountains back into the ground, while plains are heaved upward to form new mountains. Your duty is to do and not to doubt. Your duty is to obey without a murmur. This is the voice of Nkulunkul, the Most High. From the summit of Mount Tabazimbi, the beautiful silver goddess Ma can only vaguely discern a blaze of light, a formless, ageless immortal. This is Unkulunkul, the Most High. I shall do and obey. I am but a tool and a toy in your hands, O great spirit. The heavens are still. The sea has retreated back to the coast. The sun has gone to rest behind the jagged mountains. Your wish for a partner shall be granted, imperfect one. You are female, and your companion shall be your opposite, a male. The silver goddess is filled with the kind of joy only a goddess can feel and still live. He shall bring contentment to you, and both you and he shall bring forth life upon the earth. Ma sits down to rest. She wonders what her male counterpart will be like. She imagines him to be just as beautiful as herself. She impatiently waits with burning desire. Dawn arrives. Her mate calls. Ma runs with outstretched arms to embrace her companion. But oh, what a horrible sight. Great vines reach out to her, springing from a monstrous trunk, bigger than the biggest baobab tree that ever grew on earth, the most hideous baobab tree that ever grew on earth. I am the tree of life, your mate, and I desire you. The tree draws her in for a bruising savage kiss. Then with more and more branches he holds fast his shrieking mate. I leave the rest to your imagination. Let's just say the goddess has good reason to regret the wish she made to the almighty spirit. 
At last, Mai is released. She flees madly in protest to the Great Spirit. The Tree of Life pursues her relentlessly, using his roots to haul his bulk like a spider or a crab. The terrified goddess flees over plains, valleys and mountains, until they reach the great barren wasteland known today as the Kalahari. Ma dives into Lake Makarikari, swimming like a luminous silver fish, then soars like an owl into the night sky. Here the Tree of Life, wading through the mud, makes one last desperate effort. He scoops up a mighty mound of clay and sand and rock, shapes it into a ball and flings it skyward with all his ugly being. The ball flies straight and true. It bounces off the back of Ma's head, going into orbit to become what we know today as the moon. Ma falls headlong into a web of branches, into the arms of her mate. The Great Spirit declares the Holy Missile to be the guardian of love. All the tribes of this dark continent respect the power of the moon and its influence on love and life. It is a reminder of the very first marriage between our goddess Ma and the most sacred tree, the tree of life. Even today, the moon makes lovers seek each other's arms. It makes wives seek the company of their children's fathers. The tree of life binds the goddess family, never to let her escape again. And for a thousand years they are together. Then the movements begin and increase with time. Ma writhes and cries out in pain, but the tree's tentacles hold only tighter for fear of another escape. This only increases her anguish. After 50 years of ever-growing agony, Ma frees herself and wriggles and rolls on the barren earth in an attempt to ease her inexplicable suffering. She counts the stars in a desperate attempt at self-hypnosis. At long, long last, she is relieved of her birth pains. The first nation is born. In the multitudes, they come pouring out and spread to populate the barren Kalahari. At the same time, green buds burst from the branches of the Tree of Life. Clouds of seed are scattered across the rocky plain. They take root, and from them come all kinds of plants covering the earth like a green carpet. Next, from fruits which look like balls of solid honey, the tree gives birth to snarling, hissing, and howling beasts. The first animals come tumbling down in their millions and scatter into the new forests. From the great cracks in the tree's trunk, birds of all kinds come forth, filling the air with their love calls. From the roots come reptiles of all shapes and sizes, and clouds and clouds of insects. The song of life has begun, and the song is still being sung today. But one day it may trail off into oblivion, leaving at most the faintest echo. What we see today are but pitiful scraps of what the Tree of Life brought forth, because Ephah, the spirit of total extinction, has long since consumed them all.